a statement in the book. First, we acknowledge the first uh, in the 60s started biotelemetry. It started with monitoring wild animals. And um, Stuart Mackay, who I think is still alive, he had the idea of applying it to human health that some implants may transmit data and even receive data to correct for disease. They, they had a close meeting in the American Museum of Natural History. We are lucky to, and thankful for a nicer environment, at least artistically. And there are two things. Here we are going soon to start the process. Now that we'll finish today, also a statement of this event. I will show a slide next with a few items, a scaffolding for discussion. We'll make a round of all participants uh, that sh should try to hang along this scaffolding. And then we will develop further online and we'll come up with a statement. And second, as academician, we are about to conclude a contract with Oxford University Press for an ordinary academic book. It's important and they wish to know that we are all committed as requested in the original invitation to write the chapter or whatever, uh, young and old, tenured and aspiring. This is important. And we will work, we'll get the, you know, the timeline. You have all been through this, when to submit first draft, and we'll edit and we'll try to get a, a good academic product that really reflects the excellence in this group, the diversity. Now I'll start the discussion. Now the next slide. Now. Thank you. Ma? I show it first and then I'll ask for light. See, you say here, full luce. luce. So, um, this is an uh, evidence-based creature observed by many good scientists in the Middle Ages, amphibious, and we hope to discuss and not to reach the lower state. And these are the issues I think what's called conceptual clarification, the use of the word, and whether they're important, as Giovanni says, person, individual, and it has to be true to science, and we have to think of the side of science, whether the evolution there, side of clinic, and of public health, ultimate impact on epidemiology. We have to be true to the public. It's highly important when people who want to do good use inflammatory language in a power presentation before investors, the day after they have to talk with the patient. I mean, there is a tension here. The next key issue is ethical issues in personal medicine that have been mentioned, and I divided them to generic and specific. I mean, when you go about what Barbara spoke about, governance of data, is a generic, is not only personalized medicine, is an issue. And there are specific, sometimes people have claimed there are specific problems or potential problems that are more specific to personalized medicine. And I wish to highlight these in particular. Because talking about data banking in general or gender bias or race bias in general is, is a conflict of interest. It's true for all medical enterprises. The third item are circumstances of regulation and practice and issues of equity. Where we regulate the impact, the existing technologies and existing laws, there's a huge impact on how certain ideas be carried out, even good in their own rights because the personalized medicine surfaces in given situations. And the last, what I call human goals, what is wellness, what is the patient, what is commitment at the level of doctor patient or society patient, not to mention health coach, and I don't know whether he has a patient, 
So all these ultimate values where they are embodied uh, in this issue. Now we uh, will start with Margarita. Your observation and we do the cycle. No, you'll be the last. Okay, uh, Professor Legato will just go by this cycle. What you might think, what? Any observation you have to make in relation to our concluding papers, if it's related, uh, if you want, we start with Fahad. And hell, you can do or say whatever you want, but this is a kind of conceptual frame we try to tie it to the work on concepts, what concepts, the ethical issues, circumstances of regulation, and talking about ultimate human goals here. Is that maybe Fahat you wish to? Michael, this needs a little more thought, and this has kind of been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, would it be possible perhaps to think about this a little bit? I mean, all the stuff that you list are important, but what you want from the group right now is to add to these, or exactly no, what would you like? I wish, what do you think would be the three most important points to put in our conclusion? We will try to map it up on a screen. It's meant to be an, a heuristic, something to help us arrange things, but leave it aside and tell us what would be the two or three key messages to bring from the meeting that you think important and you also think is more or less common to, to what we have heard here. Uh, okay, so the two days for me, uh, the things that have come out, this is probably one of the meetings uh, that I've gone to in which the idea of precision medicine or personalized medicine uh, you had people here who were, I think, frank enough and open enough to give us an idea, a clear idea of where we stand. So I learned a great deal. I think that's one of the things. Maybe some of the people here are more tuned into how far have we gone, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's one thing that came out. As far as the, um, the other important thing is, I think there were several people here who talked about some conceptual things. As a clinician to me, uh, especially today, there was a lot of focus uh, on the relationship, the relationship between physicians and patients. And within the parameter of if the medical, if the clinical practice paradigm changes dramatically so that the dominant thing in it becomes um, genetic related. So I think that's a major area where several of us today touched on specifically, as a clinician, to me that's an important area. It may not be so much for the others. And I think the, uh, the other thing, uh, was some of the interesting, um, it, 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 the, the historical way as to how it started. And uh, for example, um, Jenny and some of the others, the historical thing, the, the how this is, um, how the industry came in, but how this has uh, become a corporate kind of thing, because those are, I, I think, you want to capture some of the important things, and those are the ones that are important to me. And the fourth thing is, I think, some of the discussions on certain concepts um, that, that came up. The issue of wellness, um, you know, stuff that, new, new terms, and, and we didn't do a lot of discussion about the fact, the patient to be, what, what is the, the new term? Patient in waiting. I mean, the, it, these are interesting, these are concepts. And so I don't know if that's one of the things that you want to capture as to what these mean. So 
off the top of my head, <laughs> that's all I can come up. Yeah. Uh, a question for me as to whether this is considered a great advance full of potential or possibly will, re will result in corporate greed, exploitation, um, the success with which we, uh, for example, unite the um, data that we have with the phenomic characteristics of the patients within the data seems to me something that is a tremendous problem and how well we will succeed in doing that is a great, uh, a great black box, to quote you. I'm also disappointed that um, there was no comment about the importance of the gender impact uh, or the impact of biological sex on the expression of genomic components, um, which I tried to emphasize, but apparently I didn't make a very good case for it. But I think when we consider interpreting the meaning uh, of this structure, never to comment on whether or not the structure comes from an XY or some variation of XY or um, XX, I think that's an, uh, that's an interesting area to explore. And um, it's not surprising that it's never considered because it's been very difficult to convince people that it was important in clinical medicine. Um, and until the last 18 years, people were convinced that the two, male and female, and all variations of uh, gender were interchangeable. So I think that's a point I'd like to make, small but interesting, I hope. I, I agree with both of what you said. I think these are, these are important points that I would raise as well. Um, I, I think, well, I, I'm torn between trying to find points where we had consensus here, which wouldn't be many, I think, but that's not necessarily bad, and, and sort of saying what I think are the main outcomes or the main take-home messages. So I, I, go, I go away thinking that the question is not should we personalize or not. I mean, we, we are already doing that, and not only in medicine, personalization is probably one of the ubiquitous trends and imperatives in our societies nowadays. Personalized, everything is personalized nowadays. So the question is how do we personalize? Who decides what we measure, how we use this information, and whose benefit seem to be the key questions, and I think these are questions that we need to address systematically. And, I, and, and the other thing, and here I have to say that I was very convinced by I, James's talk, I think um, if we are hard pressed where to place our emphasis, it should be on uh, social determinants. I don't, I don't want to be faced with this choice, but the, the effectiveness of addressing social determinants seems to be one of the few points where we all agree. Hmm. Well, um, I think if I had known we were going to have this discussion at this point, I would have been thinking about this uh, sooner. Um, I guess I thought we were, ha I shouldn't have thought let's have a discussion of these papers and then, you know, in the last session. But um, off the top of my head, um, I mean, it should be clear from things I've said that I think what's most important is to ask questions like what exactly is personalized medicine and you can't get to that unless you look at what's happening in a really deep way around the history of it, around how it's being enacted, about who the key players are. And I, th I think, as I said in my talk, I think big things are at stake, like who, who are we going to be? Like, who is going to benefit from public resources, um, institutions? Um, who do we trust? What should we trust? Um, 
and a lot more discussion is needed as opposed to just barreling forward with the idea that personalized medicine is the future. I think questioning whether or not personalized should be the future is there should be more of that. Um, and I think the, the questions around uh, what medicine is and ought to be, I mean, one thing I think happened and what I tried to argue is that when it came to the, the, the National Institutes of Health turning all of its attention to sequencing the human genome, we did not build an apparatus to figure out what it was going to mean. And what that means is in practice, you have a lot of private corporations doing that work, and we don't have an organized public response to it, and we don't have spaces for this kind of conversation, which is greatly needed. As we found out in our conversations, we don't all mean the same things by really fundamental things like trust or medicine or wellness or health or any of these things. So we're lacking basic civic infrastructure for understanding what we're even doing, um, which is, I think, new. I think there was more of a sense of what the problems were in the past. I think it's less clear now. Um, it's less clear what the stakes are. It is clear there's a lot of money involved. We may be, I mean, we may be debating over whether or not the temporality of that. Maybe it gets cheap, cheaper in the future, maybe people can afford it, but what we know now is that these medicines are the most expensive we've ever produced. Um, that the financialization of medicine and of science is a big issue and a big problem. And personalized medicine is right in the middle of that. Um, and I think that issue of, we're not, we didn't talk at all, if, as I said, 20 years ago, this conversation would have looked really different. There was, there was a lot of concern about the, the way in which genomics brought with it a way of doing science that required a lot of money. And the people on the ground doing that, John Sulston, who was promoted the open public approach to science, was very articulate about the deal with the devil he felt he did at that point. For the sake of open science, he sold out a way of doing science that he believed in, which was more open amongst human beings. To liberate the data, you had to imprison the humans in organizations that put machines at the middle and not humans. And I think that that's something that needs more reflection. What kind of institutions are we building? What kind of ways of doing science is happening here. And it may not be a problem of corporate science, but it's certainly a problem, so. Thanks. So I was thinking about what the statement might look like, and if, certainly from the uh, point of view of the Vatican, I think it'd be helpful if we could have a, some kind of summing up of where are we now in the science, what's, what's solid, what's still controversial, where are we likely to get to in the next 10 years or so. And that some of the things that struck me most about you know, hearing from s some of the foremost experts in the area is just that the disconnect on the one hand between the, the sheer sort of excitement of the imaginary of, of, of personalized medicine and the excitingness of the science compared to the actual delivered large-scale health benefits. There's, there's still that, there's disconnect, that disconnect at the moment and from everything we've heard, we may still be there in 10 years' time, there's still be this disconnect where well, we may have d done a lot more to uh, get better therapies for, for rare treatments, but that it seemed that many of the um, more complex, common uh, conditions, it seems like in, even the people who are at the cutting edge are saying, well, yeah, we don't have, we won't have, I'm not have anything for, for schizophrenia, maybe for, for, for diabetes, for Alzheimer's in 10 years' time. That seems an important message for anybody who's reading this and, and reflecting on, this, on the social importance of it to, uh, to talk about. Um, so that Given all that, and given the, uh, you know, certainly the present Pope's focus on social justice, I think some of the, the questions I was raising about just the importance of, of this project as compared to other things you could spend the same, the same money on is, is important. I, maybe I, I do take the, the, the worries or the pushback of the, of the thought is a good one to have that, well, as it were, if we never invested in, in the really experimental stuff, that, the stuff that's really difficult and expensive, we never make any progress. But to be able to, to articulate that, that worry and to put it clearly and to allow people to reflect on that and what that means for, for the future of science, I think that would probably be a helpful thing for, for the Academy.
Um, so I, I think it's important for us to be circumspect about the problems that we can address. And at some level, uh, our discussion um, descends into, <clears throat> into areas of you know, fairly deep water related to, for example, the north-south divide, how information is transferred, um, uh, in income inequality, social justice, a whole variety of things that um, are very important, but we should be a little bit careful about. Uh, my feeling, as I said at the beginning, and I'll try and channel Eric a little bit on this, uh, is that, first of all, most of what we're doing with precision or personalized medicine is the, the traditional work of medical science, and that is trying to gain additional data that relates to uh, manifestations of illness. Uh, it, it, the reality is we're populating large databases, but we're doing it in the same way that we did before. And the black boxes that, Michael, you refer to are boxes that have existed for a long time. When you look at a CT or MRI scan, you don't see the data you see the result of an algorithm. And if you don't know how that algorithm works, you're probably not gonna interpret that so well. And that's been around for a long, long time. We had the same problems, frankly, having these sorts of discussions when auto-analyzers were introduced for serum measurements, when you had a SMAC-12 and a SMAC-18, and suddenly you were doing systematic population evaluation for sodium and potassium and glucose and total protein. It was very much the same kind of discussion uh, about the meaning of those things and endless correlations between various outliers and disease states and what did it, a what did it actually mean to see an, an abnormal result uh, on a lab slip uh, and how long it took, uh, frankly it's still not done, to inform physicians about what to do with an abnormal lab value. You know, that the probability of seeing an abnormal value is one minus the, the probability raised to the power of the number of observations. So you're going to see lab abnormalities. So that, that you're going to see the same thing in these data sets. Um, so I, I think it's really a, a quantitative rather than a qualitative difference. And while I recognize that quantity has a quality all its own, uh, nevertheless, I think these things are not so different. I think there are two differences that are important. Uh, the first a difference is that we're talking about uh, the evaluation of healthy people. And while we've always created standardized documents, for example, for auto analyzers, about uh, what the distribution of normal values is, we're now talking about do you fit into a category of well? What is well? Um, physicians traditionally have asked patients, what is your complaint? And if the complaint is, I want to know if I can be weller than I am, that, that's not a traditional a, a complaint that a physician knows how to respond to. And I think it, it requires us to put it in, in the point of light and ask, actually ask whether we know what that means, to be weller than you are. So I think wellness is a difficult thing to get at, and the number of correlations you'll get out of large databases will, will be very, very large um, and, and hard to explore despite the very uh, significant number of observations that have been made in the literature, as, as Lee talks about. Um, it, it is not the case that this is all about DNA sequence. Uh, as we often say, you know, your genome is not your destiny. Uh, the, the genome gives you information that tells you something about susceptibilities, probabilities, but it doesn't tell you the narrative of your life. Uh, and frankly, concordance uh, uh, for, for most diseases, virtually all, concordance among identical twins is modest. Modest. And, and so the, the genome is not predicting exactly what's going to happen. Uh, it, instead, it, it gives you a, a road map of potential diagnostic possibilities and potential interventions. But there is a critical issue in this, and that is the privacy issues have become much more profound now and mechanisms whereby this information by itself can be used in a discriminatory fashion and in a way that has real social justice implications, I think those are significant and that many of those issues have been raised around these, this room in the last two days and will be things that will have to be discussed. I think that's, that's a profound difference between what we got out of an auto analyzer 30 years ago and what we get now out of the detailed evaluations and data sets we put together. Well, 
Now, uh, we are at the end of um, two very intensive days in which we have been analyzing a lot of things, a lot of ideas and concepts. I think at the end of these two, two days, there are things which are more or less clear to my mind, especially the questions related with facts, scientific facts about uh, uh, genetics, the future of genetics, the personalization medicine, and so on. Uh, in, I usually analyze uh, problems in three different levels. The first level is uh, the analysis of, of facts, because it's the beginning, always. But it is necessary also to, to make a second analysis on the values at a stake. And my opinion is that it's necessary the methodological analysis of the values at the stake. Here we have been talking a lot about values, but not um, focalizing the analysis in order to clarify what is wellness, what are the differences between, between wellness and health, etc., justice, uh, confidentiality, privacy, and so on. No? And the third level, the first level are facts, the second values. The third level is how to do the duties. For it. Uh, we are finishing now our meeting of two days, and the question is, can we uh, conclude some uh, practical uh, things in order to do personally or collectively in the next future. I think in a meeting it is necessary always to conclude something and not always, not only to be discussing uh, about a, a big question, which is the question of personalized medicine, because I think we must do some things personally tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and to take some decisions personally and perhaps collectively. Thank you in any case. Dr. Hood. Uh, I think it has been uh, fascinating two days. I think many issues have been raised that we need to integrate with this concept of personalized medicine. What I would urge is that we describe personalized medicine accurately as it stands today. And I, I would say there are two fundamental changes from the medicine we've talked about before. One is the concept of wellness. Admittedly, it is poorly defined, but I clearly see it as the spectrum, and I clearly see enormous potential for optimization. And the second is the idea that wellness is the absolute key to chronic diseases in the sense of identifying the transitions from wellness to disease, having the biomarkers, reversing them, and opening up diseases like Alzheimer's in a way we've never been able to deal with them before. So I think getting that accurate is really important. I think another thing that's really important is not to have a hysterical negative reaction to companies. Companies are a part of the partnership of healthcare that we've had for a long time. And Companies, like people, have different personalities, but they make possible things academics could never do, from the creation of drugs to the creation of instrumentation. Uh, if it hadn't been for ABI, automated sequencing would have been delayed uh, till whenever the next company came along. The expense of doing it right 
is something that never could have been done in an academic institution. And I'll say another thing. As we look at really big problems in science today in the US, I would argue that the NIH takes a very orthodox view toward a lot of things. And the alternatives for really getting big, new, important projects, we're studying, for example, Lyme disease with a systems approach, taking the island of Nantucket, and it's going to be the test tube for understanding how Lyme disease starts, occurs, biomarkers, uh, therapies in the end. But the important point is, if not the government, then who? Well, one, you might think of industry, but frankly, industry is getting much, much more restrictive in what it's willing to fund. So I think philanthropy is what's really opened up interesting new possibilities to us. But I would just say philanthropy, foundations, industry, and academia are partners in this big, incredibly complicated problem. And I think we can criticize each of them, but I think we should demonize none of them. I think it's really, really an important point. And I think the final point I'd like to make, uh, just to, I would argue we now for the first time have the data to begin studying this question of sex and the differences that occur in sex all the way across the lives of people. I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating areas in personalized medicine and an incredibly important one that's been underemphasized. So I'd like to make that a real point in, the, in, in what comes out of this, uh, this uh, demonstration here. But I'd like to finally make the point that I think what we've largely ignored is the question of education. It's education for patients. It's education for physicians and healthcare system. It's education for policymakers. And, and look, these are the people that are going to determine what happens in the future. And I'll tell you, I think the group among those that's really going to drive a change in medicine are the patients if they're properly educated. And I just show you an example of look what the AIDS activists did uh, when they forced a reluctant industry and government to try triple drug therapy. They, they changed it from a fatal disease to a chronic disease. And I think patients are going to do the same thing with personalized medicine. As they come to realize the opportunities, and we've seen it. We've seen a number of our individuals that are in this wellness program change doctors because the doctor uh, was too rigid to even learn anything about what was going on with the patient with regard to wellness. Thank you. My comments are actually going to concentrate more on process than substance. So I'm sorry to be a bit loyally. <laughs> Um, I think it's important to divide out, to separate the position paper or white paper or whatever it is that you wish to draw up as a basis. And in that I entirely agree with Roger that it's important to be fairly circumspect, circumspect excuse me, and fairly limited. Because it does seem to me there have been very major areas of disagreement. And I think it's well to foreground those in our minds and not attempt to make bigger claims that we can genuinely claim as a group. Um, I was actually a bit concerned about the title of the revolution of personalized medicine. I think it is contentious as to whether it is a revolution. And I was a bit concerned about the subtitle, are we going to cure all diseases? In fact, I was quite concerned about that. Um, to which I think the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. But as far as the book goes, and I hope I can say something a bit more positive there, even though I am the co-editor of a competing volume, <laughs> uh, which may be an issue, actually, and that is the one from Cambridge University Press. Generally, in England, we think Oxford and Cambridge don't get on terribly well. <laughs> I should turn to see. First, the title of the book is different. Second, all of the viewers of Oxford University Press, as we know, don't have a concern about sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I'm sure it's fine. Well, the reviewers, they all said that we all know Donna Dickens. Go on the question, do you know the authors? So this is Barilan, we don't know, they do not know, but Donna well, said Donna Dickinson, excellent, excellent, published the book. So we are less worried about this. They, are not, they know about your book in the other pub, uh, publishers, and they welcome what's special about this book. Um, the background context of Montfield Academy, the mixture of scientists and ethicists and social scientists, uh, the level of participant, so uh, this is not an issue at all. We have to have the commitment, unless you feel that you have an issue of contributing an original uh, chapter. And uh, to be able also for the book not to build a consensus, but a line of narrative, some structure to present. Even controversy has a way of represented it, representing it in, in ways that are a little uh, coherent. I think, because I have read a few times the position papers, all the literature sent by others and try to listen well, there are more points of agreement than we think uh, at this moment. Because what we register is the points of disagreement and we naturally tend to, of course, this is evident, this is evident, but this, when, when the point of gender that we're not common much, because at least I don't know much about, nobody would say is not relevant, is not important, and a very similar point was made in relation to race, that or ethnic background or geographic sampling, or any way you put it, uh, that the group of reference may have influence on many other genes or proteonomics or whatever. Okay, but let me just finish what I was going to say about the book. Um, I think it is very important and, you know, I have edited a number of volumes and I've written 25 books or edited. Um, and I think it is extremely important that you distinguish the book from the conventional collection of articles emerging from a conference because frankly they don't sell very well and presses are less interested in them. Now when Margarita and I worked together to try to develop the means of operation, the modus operandi, of this entire network, I think one thing that we developed that is useful and, and should be incorporated in the book are the commentaries which we were all asked to prepare yeah. on the position papers. So I would think it's, we haven't referred to them so much, although they have provided a useful background and increased our awareness of other people's papers. I would really like to see some way in which that can be incorporated. I think that would be a big strength. It would tie together the different presentations. So it's, I said I would concentrate on process rather than substance, but I think that particular piece of process would improve the substance considerably. I, the publisher was less enthusiastic about, in, no, no, it's not his final word. We are, your idea or, that you devised with Margarita about the position paper, the comments, and have something like the SIBA collection, but especially following your comment, in, in the beginning I thought, and I talk about it much, that, uh, yeah, i be fast, um, that the comments will be in, would be incorporated, but we may try to do it in a separate manner, and we'll go back to the publisher uh, and try to, to promote it. But maybe later we talk about the technicalities that everybody manages uh, to, to, to say a few points. Sorry, I don't mean yeah. to hold the floor. I didn't actually mean that you would publish them separately. What I meant was that each author should try to incorporate and respond yes. to, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, respond to the critiques of other colleagues. Um, my, um, my sense is that there are like three levels of questions that came up here. One has to do with uh, what, we, what we mean when we say personalized medicine, and I think it's interesting uh, um, 
uh, Lee Hood said that we should be precise about the meaning, but in fact, uh, what seems to me is that it's interesting to draw a certain spectrum between more conservative views and more ultimate, uh, ex more uh, uh, far-reaching views of, of what personalized medicine is. We heard here many different things. You know, uh, Joe Finns um, gave one uh, uh, angle and, and uh, um, Chris, Christopher? Chris. <laughs> Chris talked about rare diseases, and uh, Lee Hood gave his, so there's, and, and, and many others. So there's a whole spectrum, and I think it's interesting on one level just like to, to show the spectrum of, of what is intended by the meaning, uh, by, by the term. Uh, there's a second level, there's another uh, level of, of treatment of, uh, uh, and that is what kind of meaning it has for the human condition. Um, uh, how do we understand ourselves? Post-genomic condition is, uh, um, that's, that's a second uh, level that, uh, and the third level is the ethical questions. Um, and I think that something that uh, is interesting to reflect about uh, is the connection between those levels. Uh, for example, I wonder to what extent we need to agree on the meaning of the post-genomic condition in order to advance on the ethical questions. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's something interesting to reflect about. Uh, now we're like in the absorbing uh, state of like everything that was said here, but you know, once, once things are absorbed and to try to think, um, you know, to what extent we can extrapolate from ideas of justice that we have, um, you know, pre-post-genomic condition uh, and uh, without agreeing on the sense of personalized medicine or precisely what kind of existential new meanings it has, if it has. Uh, so, so the connection between those levels of uh, what we mean by the term, what kind of more existential meaning it has, and uh, what kind of, of, of ethical conclusions we draw, um, it's, it's interesting to think about, about how these levels relate uh, uh, to each other, it's, it's a very general, I'm saying something very g general, but that's the level on which now I'm processing it. So I'll just make, make three points. Um, again, the advantage of going at the end is that, you know, a lot of the important points have been made already, so thanks everybody. I think um, the first point is, uh, if it hasn't been said, thank you to the Academy and to the Pope himself for uh, for having us here. Um, I, when I first got this introduction, in, uh, invitation, I thought, boy, that's an odd uh, invitation. Um, and it's, it, it, but it's not so odd, actually. Um, and and, and it's, it's clearly a, a, for, a unifying force, potentially, which, uh, as you can see from this meeting, I think it's been extremely positive, so thank you. Uh, clearly, um, you know, I thought uh, living in the world that I do, I thought I had cast a rather wide net in the people that I work with and associate with. I mean, we're I'm working hand in hand with barbers, for heaven's sake. But but I realized uh, that that's not true. Actually, there were things said at this meeting which I, I had literally never thought of. I, I, and and that's always the sign of a good meeting when you've you've brought people together to think in different ways, uh, and that doesn't doesn't happen as often at least to me as is it as it should be. The second point is um, the. Uh, it reinforces um, a, a conclusion that I've come to from, for different reasons about the importance of the centrality of the patient or the participant or whatever we want to call the person in, uh, as a central factor. And if you remember the graph that I showed that that's in the middle of our little, uh, little diagram, um, which um, has always been traditionally in medicine, but I think in research, 
perhaps and in genomics, we've sort of lost track of that at times. And, and there's all kinds of reasons for doing this after this meeting, not the least of which is that um, it, some of the, we're all aware, I think, that perceptions can drive reality. And, and, and some of the perceptions that I would have thought would not have been uh, adopted by, by people who in other fields clearly are possibilities that I, I didn't even envision. So this is really important. Uh, and, and the third, is, uh, a third point is about the, 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 this question of personalized medicine and the cure-all diseases, this thing. And I think this name actually indicates to me that we're using the terms differently. Uh, because I think if you've heard multiple people say, I actually don't see this as a revolution. I think you see it as an evolution, but the fact that people do see it as a revolution is really important. Um, the, the fact that, that personalized medicine is connected to are we going to cure all diseases, I actually don't see those, I see those as parallel, not, not necessarily related to each other, but I, it's interesting that other people see it differently. I, I don't think we have addressed the second question, the, 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 the subtext. Um, I think what we could say we've done is to talk about personalized medicine at its current state and are we going to go forward with it and at what price sociologically as well as financially. I think we'd have to have a separate meeting on the other question, which is a very interesting question. And I, what I tried to get across is that, that, that fundamental science really has set up, set us up, and translational science, I hope, has, 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 have, has set us up uh, to uh, uh, and novel technologies to think about how we might do this and decrease the cost of production and, and increase the speed enough to actually not cure all diseases but certainly treat more diseases. I, I could sign up for that, uh, in, at, but again, at what price? Uh, but that's a separate meeting, which perhaps uh, you could recommend to the Pope that he have us all back uh, for another delightful couple of days here. So I just want to echo Chris's uh, thanks to the, to, the, to the Pope, the Vatican, and, and for all of you as terrific colleagues and I hope friends. Uh, I've learned a lot. It's been one of the best graduate school seminars I've had in the last few years. Um, I want to just um, echo some themes. One is I think the definitional issues have to be parsed out in, this, in, in some introduction to the book or, or, or statement. I think that uh, one of the major themes has been about individualism versus communitarianism, which I think you know has come out because we have a mix of sort of the American libertarians and the European communitarians, and I think that's an important theme. I think it's important to talk about the distributive justice issues and the issue of common good. We got into a little mini debate about with Barbara and and uh, my question yesterday about taxing, you know, data. I think the granularity is less important than the impulse to to uh, return benefits as we return results um, to, to the people. Um, I think that uh, that second point is that we're, you know, we're moving towards precision medicine, but we have a great deal of imprecision in the clinical transaction, um, that doctors are ill-prepared for the translation of information. And I think it's a translational function. Chris and I were talking a little bit about this over lunch, and I think that's an unfulfilled mandate. Um, and I think it does echo nicely with the priestly tradition of of, of counseling, comforting, and educating. And doctor, of course, in Latin comes from doctori, means to, to, to be a teacher. Um, I think we have to teach the, the teachers, uh, and I think that's a theme. These are non-contentious things I want to bring out. The next point is one of complexity. I, I think uh, we, we want to, and I, when I asked Eric the question about through the lifespan, the Apa little e, I think we have to understand there's complexity within the individual, between individuals, families, and society. We want to do everything we can to be anti-reductionistic, even though a lot of this will be targeting specific areas. Um, so there's the, that and the education mandate. Another major theme that came out in Shlomo's talk and Jenny's talk is power and distrust, uh, and and how do we rebuild that trust? I, I think we 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 shouldn't. Uh, we should do this in a constructive way. One of my favorite philosophers is John Dewey, and he wrote a book about, re about reconstructing the good. Uh, and I think we have to reconstruct the good. This is a human edifice. We have to rebuild it. And we have to value science. I think we have to play off um, the we and the me and see that it's institutions like the NIH and, and, and institutional science that makes this all possible. 
uh, but at the same time, there is a concentration of power, wealth, uh, and, and it's, it's uh, first world and other world, and, and so we have to really try to understand that. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, one phrase, one word that didn't come out, I don't think, unless I was sleeping with my jet lag, was conflict of interest. Uh, and, you know, and I think that, that, you know, it's been, did anyone ever say that word in the, in the meeting? Uh, you did. Um, I must have been asleep at the wheel. Uh, but, but, I, but, I, but I think that um, the, the issue of power and rebuilding trust is, is important. Now, and I think, in, just as a last point, um, I think the Vatican um, is one of the most powerful institutions in the world. Uh, it's a small little state, but it has a tremendous amount of reach. And I think we should use this to be, uh, a, a countermodal to, to the other concentrations of power, and I think the Vatican has done something that only a few institutions can do, and it's the convening power of bringing us all together to speak across, uh, across uh, uh, regions uh, from different disciplines, and I think we should talk about the comedy, not the not comedia, but comedy with an IT, that how we came together in common purpose and common cause to do something for the good of humanity. Um, and, and I think we should be positive about this. This is, and I also think, the last point, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, this, we, 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 if we critique it, we, we, you know, it looks like Galileo and all that in the, you know, the 16th century, uh, we, or 17th century. We want to go forward and we want to be positive and constructive because if we do this right, people will benefit. And I think that should be, you know, for the good of humanity, should be the ethos that, that motivates what we try to do in this statement. It's different of the history of the English people to put. <laughs> yeah, I, want, I don't want to get into Galileo here of all places, but I thank you for your hospitality. <laughs> Marber is right by Pius XII and said that Galileo was the leader of the first generation of the academy. So. The last will be the first in the Lord's kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, um, I had the possibility, the chance to, to, to think about it after this. Uh, uh, this uh. So I, I wouldn't uh, emphasize that uh, 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 personalized medicine or precision medicine is, is something specific, uh, something so innovative in the history of medicine, because uh, if there is, uh, there is an history of medicine, he could say that uh, 1953, Linus Pauling wrote a paper on sickle cell anemia the molecular disease. In uh, 1932, uh, Giacinto Viola, an Italian uh, physician, wrote uh, the individual constitution about uh, the personal way of treating disease. In uh, 1932, uh, a German uh, pathologist wrote Molecular Pathology, uh, a, a book about uh, the molecular uh, origin of, of disease. And uh, uh, there is another called uh, Brausch. No, the conclusion is that uh, 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 we misrepresent history if we, if we uh, think that uh, uh, precision medicine is something specific. Precision medicine, and I think that we do, we shouldn't uh, discuss about the definition because uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, we have a good definition proposed by uh, the national U.S. National Research uh, uh, Council, uh, and so there is no point in discussing again and again and again about definition, because uh, uh, as the, the, the Middle Age philosopher taught us, it is, uh, it is a, a waste of time. And uh, uh, there is one point that we have, the, the medicine we have, because uh, the technology we have, we have uh, a, a great, uh, a powerful, uh, uh, sequences technologies, we have a, a powerful uh, IT technologies, uh, information technologies. Sometimes, and uh, it is something that is missed uh, during these two days, that the uh, precision medicine is not sequencing technologies, but it also imaging technologies. And the imaging technologies open a totally different uh, 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 field. Sometimes we focus too much on DNA or uh, instead of we forget what is uh, uh, the imaging. Uh, in, this day, in these two days, a lot of problem uh, has been highlighted, and I think that this should be highlighted, that, that, that there is problem, there are problems, and in any other uh, moment of the history of medicine. 
What we can do is not to change the world because uh, we are not the Pope, or, uh, we are not uh, Trump, or we are not uh, something like this. We do not have this, this kind of power. But we can do something, and uh, uh, I came again to the, my original idea, is that, is that uh, we can change uh, the way in which we, we train uh, the life scientist and the clinician, the young clinician, that is uh, exposing them to, uh, to the ethical problem, to the societal problem, to the economic problem, to all the problems we have discussed. This is something that we can do, and we can do uh, in a very short time without uh, uh, trying to revolutionize the, the, the world. So, uh, at the end of the day, I wouldn't stress that it is innovative. I wouldn't stress the different definition because there is no point in, in doing this. But I, I would stress the problem that uh, uh, this kind of medicine uh, 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 have and the, pos the possibility not to change the world, but to do something which is feasible in, the, in very short time, that is ask for a change in the training of the life scientists ask for a, a, a change in the training of the clinician and do uh, something uh, 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 along this line. Um. Just one word about the, the biology and um, we should be a little bit more humble and therefore maybe it's a good idea to separate between the biology and the ethics. Uh, we are at the end of a very tiny humble beginning. The genome is there, hardly so. We know very little about the genome, but we shouldn't forget that the functions are carried out by proteins, and the way to the proteins is very long. On top of the genome, there is the RNA, and then there is the microRNA, and the long non-coding RNA, and RNA is a different creature, completely different in stability, and so on. The proteins, the technology about the proteins is still far away in its sensitivity. And on top of the proteins, we have numerous endless post-translational modifications that they all regulate the activities of the proteins. We are far away from understanding what's going on. We godify the genome because for the first time, we are touching human health or we are touching human beings uh, because we are talking about medicine, but we shouldn't forget the DNA is with us as we know it for more than 70 years. I was sequencing DNA in a different technology, in the sanger gilbert technology already in the 80s. It takes decades to develop technologies. They are moving fast, but nevertheless, it takes decades. We are 70 years into this. Now, forget about biology and go to the diseases. We are far away from understanding a huge bulk of diseases, psychological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, even metabolic diseases. We are hardly at monogenic diseases, hardly at monogenic diseases, and we understand something about mutations in cancer, but we don't understand genome instability, why new mutations are coming up, and so on and so forth. So the big hype and the sensitivity is mostly due because we are touching human beings, but not because the biology is that much advanced. There is much to be developed yet on the biology, and side by side we should be aware that there are bioethical issues, but we shouldn't wait with the bioethics, because bioethics we can move even without knowing yet the biology. We can, for example, think about um, um, uh, germ cell uh, editing uh, without doing germ cell editing, just by understanding what it means. And then learn and then draw conclusions about uh, bioethical issues on germ cell editing, whether we want a moratorium, partial moratorium, come to an agreement. We don't have to wait to the biology uh, to come up. So I think that the, you know, the biology will develop, the technology will develop, it will take decades to unravel the secrets and even then there will be new secrets. We know that uh, biology and, uh, and technology are like um, the Tower of Babylon, but an inverted tower of Babylon. Uh, we are climbing up, but the diameter uh, grows with it. So uh, um, we shouldn't really uh, attribute much. We are not at the end of anything yet. We are at the very, very, very beginning. And that's why, if I may say two words, usually the academy is used to conclude this kind of workshop and meetings with final statements. But we were not asked to do such a work. We were not asked to do a summary. We were not asked to express agreement. We uh, 
have had the opportunity in these two days actually to see better our disagreement. And uh, it is also unique, uh, this meeting, in a sense that usually only scientists have been participating in different topics, but expressively uh, in, with, with a clear request of including bioethicists, there was a real um, decision to create space of inclusion and representation of different perspective. And this, I really truly believe it, it's a unique uh, possibility for us to uh, convey and to debate and to put up on the table all our agreement, disagreement, and the beginning of this um, pathway. Uh, in this sense, I really believe it is a great opportunity and um, it's a unique forum and uh, we personally, I have uh, only a thanks word to you and to the Academy to give us this opportunity, this free opportunity to do it. Marcelo, shall I say a few words and then you do a few words? Yeah, yeah. yeah? Uh, you do the last word. Oh, okay. Yeah? Uh, of wisdom. Um, well, let me thank you all for, um, uh, for having made um, extremely interesting and important contributions. Um, uh, special thanks uh, to Michael and Margarita. Um, uh, I, um, I think um, the guidance which you have provided were excellent. Michael, I also like the outline of the uh, books, the draft outline which you have put forward. Uh, because it provides structure, actually it provides more structure than the workshop had. Um, uh, you start out by clarifying um, uh, concepts and then come to ethics. I think we suffered a bit from a back and forth and mix. Uh, that was creative and interesting, um, but uh, uh, the book uh, should uh, have that clarity. So. Uh, what I think also is important that disagreements are pointed out in the book. Um, um, and um, the book and whatever conclusions which you draw, which you will draw, I, th I think uh, should take to heart uh, the point uh, Professor Hood made several times on education. Uh, let's, let's not ask for education, but please, this community should be educational. The book should be educational. Uh, your conclusions should educate uh, your targeted communities, not just in science, but beyond. And uh, then uh, it will be of tremendous help for, uh, tremendous help, um, for uh, moving forward from the early positions which uh, uh, you are in. Let me make a couple of observations as an outsider who has, I hope I can say, learned a lot uh, from you, um, but probably hasn't absorbed it yet. Um, my first point is um, uh, we are in a situation where um, a progress in basic science in biology and genomics and in uh, mathematics and informatics have come together and um, move uh, us into the opportunities of uh, um, precision medicine, personalized medicine. And um, as typically is the case, um, um, when science moves ahead, uh, institutions follow with some, uh, with some jet lag. And uh, that's uh, the situation also here. I think um, uh, we need to think very hard that uh, we are clear on the reference system. Uh, what's the mental model of comparing a world with personalized medicine versus without, before and after? I think we need a mental model uh, that uh, compares the with, without, before and after. And that reference system was not always clear in the room. That's why I think um, the, um, there were um, conflicts which didn't exist because of lack of clarity of who compared 
um, uh, personalized medicine with a rather pessimistic outlook whether the institutions would be good in shaping the ecology in which uh, uh, would work out or whether the institutional framework would not come about and then uh, we would be uh, in a gloom and doom scenario. So I think clarity uh, on the reference system would help a lot to find islands of consensus in the room uh, in the future. Um, smaller things I think which could clarify the way forward include uh, the relationship between uh, personalized medicine and public health, um, the equity issues, um, and the metrics um, of uh, progress or lack thereof. Um, but um, um, I also would probably uh, uh, emphasize, I would emphasize that it probably would make sense if those of you who argued from uh, very interesting ethical perspectives uh, would make even clearer in the book on uh, what is your point of reference in ethics or where did you come from so that uh, the, uh, the clarity of the uh, conclusions in each of your chapters uh, and uh, uh, in the books then become more, more crisp. Let me emphasize again, I enjoyed this meeting. It was uh, an intellectual feast. Um, and um, uh, I, I wish you success with the Oxford University press book, um, um, be it competitive and complementary with the one from Cambridge. Uh, but I would like to still ask you to do the two-page um, uh, pamphlet I call it purposely like that, uh, which summarizes your uh, insights, maybe not conclusions, insights from this workshop, because um, you have gained, uh, all of you have shared insights, and if they are internally incoherent, you can signal that. I think, Margarita, you, uh, you hinted at that. So, uh, not a policy conclusion, but a, um, um, a, a summary of um, salient points uh, in the humble way which uh, many of you have mentioned in this last round. Thank you again. I, uh, after the president, not, I know not have too much to say. Different. And I be happy with the meeting. I thank Aaron, first of all, that for many years we want to, to do this meeting. And uh, of course, Margaret and, and Michael for the organization and for the chairman of the meeting in a very strong way. <laughs> so very well. But uh, I, I wish to have an, a conclusion, a statement. And, uh, and I think that the, the, the intervention of Aaron was very important. We need to put the different, different capitals, one about the new things, the genetic code and the genes and all this new, absolutely. And, um, and the other is the relation with this, with the, the private ethic and public ethic and just justice and, and, and the different part of the world and the universality of this, uh, the science and these kind of things that could be very important. So <laughs> we can take the, the, the words that say Aaron in the beginning. Eh? I think this is very important. Also because it was Aaron to introduce all the people he present to the academy. So. Uh, he has a special responsibility, we can say, in the, in the conclusion of the meeting. So, but really, I th the more important word is to thank all of you for your participation, uh, very intense and active. And uh, of course, I thank also my collaborators to, to the work to do, especially Simonetta, because many times I not was present, and uh, the other people of the, the team of the academy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.